Welcome to Lecture 5, Orbits and Gravity. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the semester, the vast majority of this class is focused on stars and the universe, uh, as you gather from the name of the class. But it turns out that, uh, that gravity and orbits, um, even orbits of galaxies and stars in their galaxies and so on, play a critical role in, in a lot of what we will be discussing. So today we're going to start off, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about orbits um, and gravity's actions within the solar system because that's the context in which they were first studied and in which uh, even today we they're best studied because they're they're in our backyard as it were. Um, but then we're going to take those principles that we discover from uh, from the, the local astronomy that we can do here uh, with relative ease, and we're going to extrapolate that and apply those principles to try to understand. Um, the the universe as a whole. So that's what, that's the plan for today. And so let's go ahead and jump in. So as you may have heard, um, there have been throughout history a lot of different ideas about uh, the Earth's place in the universe, um, the size of the universe, and and what the universe is. Okay, so. We are certainly not going to spend a lot of time talking about things like geocentric models of, of the solar system, but we're going to touch on it here just to give kind of a little bit, a very high level view of the development of our understanding over the centuries and sort of the how science works. You know, we talked in the very first lecture, you know, what we ended up talking about at the, at the very end was the scientific method and how there's this constant uh, sort of refining process that goes on in terms of understanding, gathering data, testing models, revising data, testing models again, and so on. And so that certainly has played out in terms of our understanding of the universe and starting with the solar system. So the very earliest models of the solar system um, involve the Earth being at the center, right? And that's, that's all that geocentric means is, right? Again, it's the name thing. Um, geo, geography, you know, earth, um, and centric or at the center. So certainly that's, that's our perception, right? And even much of our everyday uh, existence and the way that we talk about the world, when we talk about the sun rising and setting, right? We, we do that even though we know that the sun is really not doing much of anything. We're really, it's the earth rotating around its axis. We talk about the earth or the sun rising and setting because from our vantage point, here on Earth, from our in our frame of reference, as as a physicist would put it, um, that's sure what it looks like. And so it made sense. In fact, it would have been crazy if this were not the original, the first model, um, because uh, because everything you know in the early days, all of the data they had sure made it look like the Earth was at the center. So uh, so with the Earth at the center, then. Uh, You've got the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the planets. Um, they orbit around the Earth, right? Um, certainly, that's that's what it looks like. It makes makes plenty of sense. Um, and and this model uh, was formally, at least as best we know, formally put forth um, about three thousand years ago by ancient Greek philosophers. Okay, and and as you can see, so it's written in in kind of in Latin, and so if you don't speak Latin here, you might have to you know. Uh, squint a little bit and furrow your brow and scratch your head, but you know, to understand some of these things. But you can see, you, you know, this is the moon. It kind of looks like lunar, you know, and then you've got Mercury and Venus and the sun and Mars and then Jupiter and Saturn. Um, the, the order of these things is, it looks kind of right and kind of wrong, right? But again, it's because if the earth is at the center, well, what's the closest thing to us? Well, it's the moon. And so the moon must be the, the closest thing, you know, has have the smallest orbit. Um, and then you've got, uh, they've got Mercury and Venus, which come next and so on. So, um, so that they, they, there was a lot of detail, a lot of thought went into this, but this is kind of the earliest formal, uh, semi-complete model of, of the solar system. And it's a geocentric model. Now, it turns out that there were a variety of geocentric models of the universe, even from early times. And so we should be careful, the, the title of this slide notwithstanding, we should be careful about referring to the geo, uh, geocentric model uh, because there were several. But in the simplest model, uh, the Earth was at the center, you know, as, as you kind of have to be. Um, but then the sun and the moon and the stars all orbited around the Earth in perfect circles. 
And if you ask why perfect circles and why, why call them perfect, um, in ancient times, the circle was universally, among the Greeks at least, uh, agreed upon to be the most perfect shape. And as celestial objects, objects out, you know, in, in space, well, they wouldn't have said in space, but um, up in the sky, these were deemed to be very, very idealized, uh, perfect objects. And so it was almost from a philosophical standpoint, it was taken for granted that they, that they ought to travel in circles. And certainly it also, um, that was aided by, by just observations. The observations, you know, it was clear that they moved at least very nearly in circular orbits. And so the, the simplest model just says, okay, we're just gonna have these orbits. Some things are closer, like the moon. Um, you know, you got the moon here, uh, lunar, uh, it doesn't quite say lunar, but that's essentially what it is um, in Latin, um, is, is the closest thing. And then you've got various planets uh, and the sun, you know, out there, which are orbiting around the, the earth in circles. Um, but even in ancient times, there were a lot of very good, uh, very smart people. You know, sometimes there's a temptation to think that uh, thanks to the advance of technology and so on, that we're much smarter now on average than we than people were anciently. And that is just absolutely not true. You can get yourself into all sorts of trouble by by assuming that um, there were some very smart people historically, you know, in ancient times. And there are some very smart people today and plenty of stupid people to go around uh, both then and now. So uh, by no means uh, are we smarter on average. Um, but, um, so back then, you know, people did sit around and the people that, you know, have the time uh, and the inclination took a lot of detailed data and started to observe that, well, the data didn't exactly match the models. Okay. So there was a lot of good in it. There was a lot of things that it did predict reasonably well, um, but some things didn't quite match. And so let's talk about that. The first thing that didn't match uh, and the most obvious had to do with planetary motion. Um, and in particular, if you pause for a second and think, um, you know, you might wonder why on earth did the ancients even talk about planets at all? How did they, they certainly didn't know what planets were, right? They didn't grow up with the images for, you know, of the, uh, the Viking uh, spacecraft you know, took of, of a number of the planets in, in our solar system. Um, and so they had no idea what these planets were. Why, why didn't they just call them stars? And the answer is that they, they behaved differently in the sky. They moved differently in the sky. Um, and in particular, the vast majority of the stars moved in a very orderly, orderly pattern. They always moved in the same direction in the sky. They, all, they moved in very, in very predictable circular uh, you know, tracks. Um, but then there were these few other stars or apparent stars that move differently. Um, and so they were known as wandering stars. And, uh, and that's, that's the origin of the word planet. It just comes from the Greek term meaning wandering star. And so it wasn't that they knew that they were something, that they were fundamentally different in the sense that stars are, are, are you know, very hot balls of plasma that generate light through nuclear fusion in the core, uh, whereas planets are either rocky or gaseous, uh, you know, sort of bodies of, that are, you know, quite a bit smaller and don't have those nuclear fusion processes. They certainly didn't know that. They just knew that most of the lights in the sky move in the same orderly pattern, but a few of them move differently. So they called those things wandering stars, and that's what we know as, as planets. One of the most striking elements of that wandering uh, is something known as retrograde motion. And so this is, this is a great um, image that, that's formed over the course of quite a few nights um, of Mars for what it's worth back in 2005. And so kind of a, an image taken every, every day um, for quite a few days. And you can see the, you know, the, the moon or the yeah, moon, Mars is moving, you know, very in a nice orderly fashion across the sky. And then all of a sudden, it kind of stops and reverses direction. And then it goes back the, the wrong way, if you will. Everything else is moving in the same way, but Mars reverses direction. And then after a while, it, it, it's almost like it wakes up and says, uh-oh, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, I'm going to turn around again. And, and then it kind of goes back and continues on, on its way, you know, in the same direction that it, that it was originally. Um, and that's weird uh, from, 
from an astronomical sense, and in the sense that almost nothing else in the sky does it, except for these planet things. There are these few things, these wandering stars, and this is the wandering. It's like they got lost. Um, but why on earth does that happen? From an astronomer's standpoint, even in ancient times, they, you know, it didn't take them very long to, to recognize this and, and start scratching their heads. Because if everything, you know, if this simple geocentric model of the universe is correct, where the Earth is, is sitting still, minding its own business at the center, and then everything else is orbiting around, then everything else should just orbit in, in the same direction at all times, um, and, you know, like clockwork. Um, and, and most things are doing that, again, but there are a few things that aren't. So what on Earth is going on with retrograde motion? And here's another image of, of Mars again. Um, Mars is a popular target uh, of, uh, of pictures for retrograde motion just because it's relatively close to the Earth and its retrograde motion is, is most pronounced. Um, but you can, you can see there's a cool, you know, sort of image back here as well where you see, you know, some things not doing retrograde motion, whereas Mars does this kind of loop-de-loop -loop here. So it, it looks cool. It makes for, for great images. Certainly the ancients couldn't have great pictures like this. Uh, they hadn't developed that technology yet, but they took enough data that they could, they could recognize, yeah, most of these things we, we think we understand. Everything's kind of moving the way that it should, um, but there are these few wandering stars that are doing something funky. And so they started asking, okay, how can we refine our understanding? How can we you know, adapt uh, and update our scientific model? To, to explain why this would happen. And for what it's worth, um, prograde is, the, is sort of the, the opposite of retrograde. So retrograde motion means it's moving backwards, you know, in the wrong way relative to everything else. Prograde just means it's moving in the, in the direction that you expect. And uh, it's worth saying that uh, prograde motion is east to west. And so most of the time, if you were to take, you know, a, a number of, of pictures throughout throughout the course of a month, say, uh, and follow the track, you know, you would go out and at, uh, you know, 3 a.m., you were going to take a picture of this part of the sky, you know, every night, and you were going to track the planet, uh, the stars, you know, um, or even the planets. Typically, they would move east to west, um, but when they move backwards, when they move west to east, that's what's known as retrograde motion. So, the ancients are, are trying to update their, their models. They're trying to understand, okay, our simplest geocentric model didn't work. We've got this retrograde motion out there and these wandering stars. So, why, why would that happen? So, they, they scratch their head for a while. And somebody comes up with the, this, uh, the concept of what's called an epicycle. And an epicycle is, is a simple enough thing. Uh, at least to describe, is just a small circle which is superimposed or added to um, each planet's larger circular orbit. Okay, and so you, you see it here in the sketch. Each, you know, you've got the Earth here in the center because, again, we're, we're in a geocentric model of the solar system. And then you've got the, the moon and all the planets and the sun, too, which are orbiting in, in circular orbits. But instead of just orbiting in a simple circular orbit, you have these planets which also have these additional circles kind of superimposed on top of the big circles. And so um, it, f from a modern perspective, this looks kind of, you know, pretty complicated, frankly. You know, I look at this and I think that's not very elegant. Um, but to the ancients, it seemed elegant. Um, they liked circles, right? That's the most perfect shape. And so if you can add circles, to, you know, what's better than, well, the, I don't know if it's better than simple circles, but since simple circles didn't work, uh, the next best thing is to have circles on top of circles. And so the idea then was that you had the solar system where each body in the solar system was, you know, orbiting in a circular orbit with an epicycle kind of superimposed on it. And then you had these fixed stars, which are things apparently much, much farther away. Um, that just kind of move, you know, in, in, normal, in normal ways that, that the ancients thought they understood. And so here is a, an animation, kind of shows what it would look like from Earth. So again, you've got Earth here in the center. You've got some planet, call it Mars, since that's our favorite uh, planet to study retrograde motion of. 
And then you've got the fixed stars out here in the background, which are just sort of minding their own business and doing, doing sensible things from our vantage point. And so what happens is, as you, as you see the, as you see Mars go through its orbit, it kind of, the center of the epicycle moves around this big circular orbit, while Mars itself orbits around in, in the epicycle around the center of its orbit. And so you can see that naturally gives rise to this retrograde motion because in general, the, the large scale, the course behavior of its orbit is, uh, is east to west, is in the standard direction. Um, but every once in a while, Mars comes around and it's in, when it's in between the center of its epicycle and the Earth, it will, for a relatively short period of time, travel backwards in the sky, which is exactly what's observed in, in retrograde motion. So, uh, so this was the earliest uh, example that we know of, in, you know, of an updated model. They were following the scientific method even back then uh, to explain why, why do we observe retrograde motion. And so uh, there are a lot of really cool pictures that can be drawn um, with, with epicycles. If you follow the, the, um, the orbit, the, the, or follow a planet throughout its orbit, it traces out these pretty cool spirally type uh, you know, tracks where it's moving generally circ in a circular manner, but every once in a while reverses in this retrograde motion. Um, and so it, uh, like I said, it, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily right, but it does explain um, retrograde motion and why that would occur. And, uh, and it gives you know, some, some cool pictures as well. And so this is just a sketch of a particular model um, uh, of the universe known as, as or, or of the solar system, known as uh, Ptolemy, uh, spelled P-T-O-L-E-M-Y. Um, and then it's, and it's got several of the other planets out there. Um, and so we're not gonna study this in a whole lot of detail, but just wanna, you know, another example of, of uh, a particular model um, with some epicycles drawn in. So for hundreds of years, almost every educated person uh, in, you know, in the Greek world um, believed in the, Ptolemaic, in the Ptolemaic model. It was a geometric solar system with epicycles. Okay, um, and and so that stood around for for hundreds of years. There were, it's worth noting, a few Greeks. And, and medieval Arab astronomers who had discussed the idea of a heliocentric or a sun-centered solar system. Um, but it was really all just sort of speculation and, and it was here and there. Nobody really pushed it. Um, and frankly, from a scientific standpoint, and this is important to, to keep in mind, there wasn't any reason to push it. Um, you know, if you think back to to our first lecture, or just what you know in general about the scientific method and the development of science, um, you know, you have a model based on data. You, you collect data, you, you ask a question, you collect the data, you develop a model or in a theory to explain it, and then you test it. And so th they did this, right? And then they saw, well, okay, we've got this simple model where everything moves in circular orbits. That didn't quite work because we've got this retrograde motion. So we go back to the drawing board and say, aha, it's not just simple circles, it's circles on top of circles. They add in these epicycles. And then they say, well, okay, now that explains the, the, uh, the retrograde motion. And then they keep taking more data, more and more people watch the sky. But for hundreds of years, everything seems to work. They don't see any additional data which contradicts their model. And only a crazy person takes a perfectly good model and throws it away for no reason, right? There's, you know, there, there are plenty of theories that we don't understand or plenty of, plenty of data sets we don't understand. So um, Ptolemy's model of, of the solar system, Earth at the center, epicycles, that stood around for a long time. Until this guy, Nicholas Copernicus, came around. And he wrote a, what is now a, a very famous work called On the Revolution of Heavenly Spheres, or at least that's the English translation. I don't, I don't speak Latin, so I won't try to and, and butcher the Latin title. Uh, but he came around and he said, you know what? I can, I'm, I'm feeling a heliocentric model again. Okay. 
Um, and, and, and unlike the ancient, the few ancient Greeks and, and Arabs uh, of the medieval period that kind of talked about or speculated, well, maybe a, a heliocentric model would work. Uh, would work. Um, Copernicus actually pushed this. So, as I said, nobody takes a perfectly good scientific model and, and throws it out for no reason. So Copernicus had to have a reason for, for pushing this heliocentric model. And essentially his reason is that he didn't like epicycles. He didn't think that they seemed very, very uh, elegant. They didn't seem very uh, reasonable. In his mind, why on earth would something move in this sort of odd way, circles on top of circles? Um, and to a certain extent, that's just preference in the sense that the ancients thought this was great. You know, the ancient Greeks said, well, circles are perfect. Putting perfect with perfect, that there's no problem with that. Um, but Copernicus just, so he, he wasn't feeling it, if you will. Um, but, uh, and, and there may have been more to it than that, uh, but not, not a lot to it. Um, but one, one critical thing to keep in mind is that even if he didn't like the notion of epicycles, um, that model did explain, um, or at least predicted, was consistent with the observations of the of most stars just moving in in east to west prograde motion, and it explained, um, or at least predicted accurately, the retrograde motion of of the planets. And so certainly, it's fine if Copernicus wants to put forth a new theory and say, well, I don't like the epicycles. That doesn't feel you know doesn't feel right. Let me find a different theory. But if he's going to produce a different theory, he also has to be able to explain this retrograde motion, right? What type of simpler theory can you come up with that also explains retrograde motion? And, and so this, this GIF here um, does a pretty good job, I think, of indicating how or why we would observe retrograde motion in a heliocentric model. Um, and so again, we're going to focus on Mars here. But the idea is just that as the sun, as the Earth and Mars orbit the sun, well, Earth, because it's closer to the sun, um, is going to take less time to orbit. And so it's going to pass, there are times during the, the orbits of both Earth and Mars when Earth is going to pass Mars. If you've ever run track, it's kind of like running in lane one against somebody else who's running in lane two or four, you know, at a larger, larger radius. And so as you're running on that shorter, on the, the smaller radius path, you pass the person on the outside. And so Mars, which used to appear kind of to your left, moving to its left, now for a brief period of time, while you're passing it, looks like it's moving to your right, okay? And so, so it turns out that the heliocentric model does a perfectly good job of explaining retrograde motion as well. Um, and so it's, whereas if it hadn't, then we would just throw out the model entirely, right? Um, because you're not gonna accept a model that's at, at variance with the data. But the good news is that the heliocentric model does, is consistent with retrograde motion and explains why we would observe that um, for, for other planets in our, in our solar system. And especially for the ones that are near to us in, in you know, relatively near to us in their orbit like Mars. And so this is just another sketch that kind of shows, you know, Earth and Mars again in, in several different locations throughout their orbits. Um, and you can see that, you know, these are ba these are basically numbered in terms of months. And so, you know, it takes, you know, six months for the Earth to make half of, a, of an orbit. And you can see in those in those six months, you know, from one to seven, um, Mars is traveling. Uh, it does not make it, its way as far around in its orbit because the orbit is is larger. And so again, the result is that as viewed, so as viewed from above or as viewed from the sun, if you will, everything looks completely normal. Both of the, both Earth and Mars are moving in circular orbits um, at a regular rate that's not changing and everything is, is just going along like clockwork, if you will. But the point is that what we observe in the sky is from Earth's perspective. We're Earthbound. And so when we, when we look up in the sky and we see Mars, we don't see where Mars is objectively, if you will. We only see where it is relative to us. And so what we see is complicated if we're moving. 
right? In the geocentric model, we're not moving. And so everything, every motion we observe is actual motion. Whereas in a heliocentric model, the Earth is moving. And so what we're seeing is not absolute motion, but relative motion relative to us. And so, so that, again, does a, a very nice job of explaining retrograde motion. So now that brings us to, um, to a guy named Tycho Brahe. So, you know, at this point, Copernicus has made his, his uh, has published his theory, says, no, I think we need to rethink these hundreds, um, many, many hundreds of, of years of, uh, of astronomy and assumptions about the, the order and the, the structure of the solar system. I think the sun's at the center. Um, and, but if he's going to uh, successfully make this argument, um, we're gonna have to have a lot of data. Because again, that's a scientific method. The only way you're gonna you're gonna convince people that your theory is right is to have the data to back it up. And so, as I mentioned, Ptolemy's model had stood the test of time because it had seemingly explained all of the data so very well. Okay, so the the upshot is that if Copernicus's theory is going to carry the day, if if he has any chance of of being uh, sort of up, upending Ptolemy's um, long-standing triumph then we're gonna to have to have a lot of very precise data um, that's going to somehow be able to distinguish between these two model, models. So Tycho Brahe was a Danish astronomer um, of noble birth. One thing that you'll notice, um, particularly back, you know, if, if you look at the astronomers of note um, from history, um, many of them were noble. And there's a very simple reason for that it's because only the nobility had enough time and money to just stare at the sky and make observations like this. Um, so if you're, and as it turns out, he is, he remains a local hero. Um, and, uh, and so if you ever find your way to Sweden, you can still visit um, Tycho Brahe's observatory. Um, and it, it's, uh, I, I certainly have never been there myself, but, uh, but if you're in the area, I, I highly recommend stopping by and, and send me a report. I, I would love to visit sometime. So Brahe made a lot of observations and filled a lot of books with his data. Um, and he analyzed that data, but it turns out that even Brahe for all, and, and he's, he's one of the most well-known astronomers of, of all time, but he couldn't bring himself completely to make the jump to a Copernican model, a heliocentric model. Um, so he did something that's kind of interesting. And as far as I know, he's the only maybe there were others, but he's the only person that I know of to be associated with a system like this. He suggested a modified geocentric uh, model of the solar system in which the Earth stays at the center of the solar system and the moon orbits it, um, which is, and that's pretty straightforward because, you know, it's evident that the moon orbits the Earth, you know, from, from an astronomical standpoint. That, that much was pretty clear. Um, but everything else in the solar system orbited the sun and then the sun orbited the earth okay so you get this kind of it's it's this funny hybrid and it's funny to us now but granted if you just kind of pause for a second and think about how difficult it would be to construct um to sort of abstract yourself and imagine okay what does the solar system look like from above when you're stuck down here on earth it, it really is a very complicated uh process so um, you know, it's easy to laugh at some of the models that people have come up with in the past, but, but we should be careful about that as best we can. Still, this one is kind of a funky one where he, he, uh, he's willing to have almost everything orbit the sun, but somehow the, the, the sun still has to orbit the earth. Um, so this one, as I said, Tycho Brahe is the only person that I know of that's associated with kind of this hybrid uh, halfway system between geocentric and, and heliocentric. And this model didn't live very long, you know, not to play spoiler, um, but it's worth kind of putting out there just to show you how, you know, when how science works, because as as data is being taken, as it's uh, as, as models are being, being developed, all sorts of ideas will get thrown out there. And this is one. So at this time, a, a uh, student of Tycho Brahe's um, came along named Johannes Kepler and Kepler worked with Brahe while he was alive. Um, and, uh, but interestingly, uh, Brahe, Brahe um, 
kept some of his data pretty close to the vest. And so even though Kepler was taking data for Brahe and was helping him in, in his research, um, Brahe did not allow Kepler to have access to all of his data uh, while he was alive. However, um, when, when he died, he did uh, leave all of this data um, to Kepler. And Kepler then spent uh, a whole lot of time pouring through decades worth of planetary data. And so it's kind of mind boggling to think of the, of the amount of work that went into this. But basically Kepler and, and Brahe, well Brahe, and then Kepler and any, of other, uh, any other students of Brahe's, you know, essentially they would go out night after night after night and make meticulous uh, recordings of where planets and stars were in the, uh, in the sky, what location they were day after day after day. And then once you, once you constructed these volumes of, of planetary data, it was left to Kepler to kind of pour through these and try to, try to synthesize it, try to make sense out of it and develop some sort of unified understanding, you know, of, of how these planets are, are moving. And, and after he, he suffered sufficiently, um, he used Tycho's, uh, Tycho Brahe's data and developed three rules of planetary motion, which are known, again, not very creatively, as Kepler's laws. And so that's what we're going to turn to now. The first of Kepler's laws states the following that the sun is at the center of the solar system. So Kepler is unapologetically heliocentrist. And furthermore, that the planets, including the Earth, orbit the sun. But it goes a little bit farther than that to say that the planets orbit the sun in elliptical orbits, not circular. And the sun is located at one focus of that ellipse. So we'll dive into more detail about what exactly that means, but roughly it's depicted in this in this picture. So the you know the the planet is orbiting, but it's not in a perfectly circular orbit. It's in a kind of a squash circle, uh, known as an ellipse. And an ellipse is actually it is a technical thing. Um, it's for those of you that remember your algebra two days. Um, it's one of the conic sections, and so it has a precise mathematical definition. It, it, it is something more precise than just a squashed circle. Um, but that's what it looks like. And so the sun is at one, it's not at the center of the ellipse, it's at one focus. And, and in a moment, I'll, I'll define exactly what that means. So there are ellipses come in a number of different shapes and sizes. Um, and they're characterized by something known as the eccentricity. Uh, so an ellipse has two foci, so the plural of focus is foci, F-O-C-I, as written there. Um, and there are a couple of equivalent ways of defining an ellipse, but one way that is sort of a, a geometric way is to say that it is the set of all points such that the distance to any point on the ellipse, for, or from any point on the ellipse, to one focus plus the distance to the other focus is a fixed number. So for example, pick a number, say you want the sum of those two distances to be 10 centimeters. Well, there are, there are points like this that are very close to one focus and very far away from another focus, but the, the sum of those two distances equals 10 centimeters. And there are, are other points that are equidistant between those two foci. And so it would be say five centimeters plus five centimeters equals 10 centimeters and so on. And so it turns out there is, if you put all of those points together such that for every, every point is 10 centimeters away from each focus, again, you add, you're adding those distances together, that gives you an ellipse. And and again, ellipses are characterized by a number known as the eccentricity, which is essentially a measure of how squashed it is. And so for a, uh, it turns out that a circle is a special case of an ellipse with eccentricity of zero. That means it's not squashed at all. In that case, the two foci end up converging and become the same point. And so when, when the two foci become the same point, then, then the ellipse collapses into a circle. But as you, as you squash it, those foci move out, they become separate points, 
and the more and more squashed the uh, the ellipse is, the closer to one is the eccentricity. Um, strictly speaking, no ellipse can have an eccentricity of one because if it did, then it would be completely squashed and it would just be a, a line segment, but, but that's the limiting case. So this is another helpful sketch of, of an ellipse, I think, with some, uh, some important terms defined. So again, if you remember back, um, if it hasn't been too long since you took Algebra 2 and studied conic sections, this might uh, uh, jog your memory a little bit. Um, if it's been long enough or you just hated, hated Algebra 2 and so you didn't pay any attention in the first place, um, then it is my joy to, to uh, remind you or to, to reintroduce you to this. Um, but so you've got a focus here again, you've got two foci. Um, when it comes to Kepler's first law, again, planets orbit the sun in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. The other focus is just empty. There's just nothing there. Um, but um, there are a couple of, of terms here. There's the semi-major axis, which is half of the, of the longest, which you'd be inclined to call diameter, if you will. You know, if it was a circle, it would be a diameter. But since an ellipse is, is kind of a squash circle, one distance is longer, one diameter is, this is the longest diameter, if you will. And then this is the, the shortest diameter. And so the half of the longest diameter is called the semi-major axis, semi because it's half of the, the major axis. And then the semi-minor axis is half of the, of, the, uh, of the shortest diameter, if you will. Um, and typically the size of an ellipse is specified by its semi-major axis. There are a few equivalent ways that you could specify an ellipse, but typically the way that it's done is to is to specify the semi-major axis and then um, also specify the eccentricity because again that that tells you something about the shape of the ellipse how squashed it is now as we've stated kepler's law kepler's first law of motion specifies that planets orbit the sun in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus but it doesn't say anything about the, the shape of that ellipse. So every planet has an elliptical orbit, and as it turns out, not just planets, but any asteroids, any um, protoplanets, if we had them, any dwarf planets, anything that's orbiting uh, the sun uh, or any, uh, anything else under, the, uh, under gravity um, is going to orbit in an ellipse. So, so planets orbit the sun in elliptical orbits with the sun at a focus. But the eccentricity um, is going to vary from one planet to another and from one uh, from you know, one asteroid to another. It's uh, and so it will vary. So the Earth's orbit, uh, which we'll, we'll start with because that's you know that's where we are, um, it is only very slightly eccentric. So the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit, uh, as indicated here, is only 0.017. So 1.7% if you will. Um, and so it's, which means it's almost, almost circular. So, which I, I've said a couple of times in words, and now you have a quantitative uh, definition of, of exactly how nearly circular it is. So remember for a perfect circle, the eccentricity is zero. For the earth, it's just a little bit um, non-zero, uh, but it's, it's very nearly circular. And so um, you know, obviously right now we're talking about Kepler's laws. We're talking about the, you know, sort of models of the solar system. And so it's important to know that, um, that these orbits really are elliptical. They really are not circular. But it's also uh, important to know that uh, for most of the planets, um, and certainly for the Earth, these ellipses are, have very small eccentricities and are very nearly circular. So as it turns out, you know, if you were to take an introductory physics class, either Las Positas or even if, you know, some of you may have taken physics in high school, um, you almost always uh, say, uh, and I hope that, the, that, the, that your instructor has always said that these orbits aren't really circular, but as soon as you say that, you then almost always go ahead and assume that they are, because for almost all practical purposes, that, that approximation is good enough. Um, for us right now, um, it's not quite good enough because you know, you're going to get homework questions, you're going to get quiz questions um, that require you to know that these orbits are ellipses. But now, now you have a sense of how, um, how 
how ellipt elliptical they really are. So Pluto, again, Pluto was demoted, as I think I mentioned, so it's not, uh, not considered a, a full-fledged planet now. It's a dwarf planet. Um, but it's worth mentioning here because of all of the objects in the solar system, that, uh, uh, you know, planets and dwarf planets um, that are well known anyway, uh, Pluto has the largest eccentricity. Um, and, and in fact, that's one reason that it kind of stands out. There are a few other reasons as well that it ended up getting demoted because it's got a number of, of attributes which distinguish it from, from the rest of the, the large bodies in the solar system. Um, but so its eccentricity is, is 0.249. Um, you can see it's also much farther away than us. So that this unit here, AU, uh, which we'll talk about again in a little bit, um, but it uh, stands for astronomical unit, which just means the, the distance of the Earth to the sun. And so by definition, the Earth is one astronomical unit from the sun. Um, Pluto is 39.2 astronomical units. Um, and so it's, you know, almost, you round up, almost 40 times as far away. And so, in, which um, with a much, uh, much uh, more eccentric orbit. So, and this is just kind of a, um, a sketch of, of the, uh, a schematic representation of the solar system. Um, you know, obviously not to scale because if it were, it would not be, uh, it wouldn't be nearly as pretty. Um, but you can see you've got the, the inner planets, um, which have uh, very nearly circular orbits. Um, as you get farther out, in general, the eccentricity tends to get a little bit bigger, but still it's, it tends to be pretty small. Um, Pluto obviously has, has a reasonably large eccentricity. Um, for example, you know, that gives us suspicions that, that it may not have formed um, at the same time as the other planets. Um, we won't, if you're interested in the formation of the solar system, it turns out that Astronomy 10 is a much better place to go than 20 because Astronomy 10 focuses on the solar system, whereas we focus on stars in the universe. But, um, but certainly, the, you know, it's worth saying that um, our current belief is that the, the planet, the solar system essentially formed um, all at the same time out of a, a spinning uh, disk of gas. And so that as the disk kind of under the force of gravity collapsed, it, you know, the, it started spinning for reasons that will that we'll talk about more when we get to stellar formation. Um, and then little globs started consolidating into, you know, the sun obviously is the largest at the center, and then other globs started consolidating into planets and so on. Um, and bec it's because of the nature of, of the formation dynamics that everything orbits in the same direction, that everything tends to, that there's a, a common plane of, of the solar system that all the planets and the sun are in. Um, and and that the orbits are, are very nearly circular. Um, Pluto orbit, it, Pluto's orbit is quite different. It has a much larger eccentricity than, than the other objects you know, in the solar system, certainly than the large ones. Um, and it kind of gives us uh, pause to, to think that it may have been captured, for example, later after the solar system formed. It may have been something flying through space that got captured by the sun's gravity. Um, for example. Um, but then as you go out farther from Pluto, there are, there are um, these Kuiper Belt objects, which, which again, we're not going to spend any, any significant time talking about, um, but, uh, but they also orbit the sun in these elliptical orbits. And so, um, so the point of this slide is just kind of summarize everything that the, the main things, not everything, but the main things in the solar system and to, to drive home the fact that they all orbit in ellipses around the sun um, with the sun at one focus. Um, but the eccentricity of, of those objects varies from one to another. Okay, so that's Kepler's first law. So I told you that there, there are three laws, so let's, let's move on to the second law now. And the second one is a little more esoteric, so we're going to spend a little time talking about it and its implications, um, but the, the way that it's phrased, at least, um, the formal statement of Kepler's second law is a little more esoteric, and so um, so bear with me here. And very often this law is referred to as the equal areas and equal times law. Um, and the statement is just that if you draw an imaginary line from the sun to any planet, I'll say the earth here, just, you know, to be concrete, but this is true of any planet, um, orbiting under the influence of gravity. So you draw this imaginary line here and, 
and then you follow the the planet as it orbits and so t1 just means the first you know sometime when you start following this planet you make an observation and you say okay i'm going to start my clock and say i'm going to follow this planet for two months for example and so you're going to follow the earth for two months and it goes from you know this location at time t1 to this second location at time t2 and so in that time if you if you've drawn this uh, imaginary line connecting the earth and the sun that line sweeps out some area okay and that's labeled a here so area you know region a you know has some area okay and that was swept out again let's just i, I just picked a number i said two months okay so then you let it you uh you get tired because you were taking these measurements every night imagine you're going out looking up the sky you know and taking these measurements of, of locations every month and then you get tired so you said okay i want to go i need a vacation i want to go take a break so you went took a break for another month and then you came back said okay i'm ready to to start taking data again and so now at some time t3 you know you start taking measurements again and you say i'm going to wait another two months okay and i'm going to take data and figure out where is this planet every two months and you do that until some later time you know until two months have passed at t4 and in that time this imaginary line has swept out some different area some different region b okay but the statement of kepler's second law is that the area of region a is equal to the area of region b okay moreover you could wait several months more and take additional measurements over here between times t5 and t6 and and the area that would be swept out in region c would again be exactly equal to the areas of regions a and b okay and so this is not obvious just by looking at it right because but what you'll notice is that you know the the line is shorter in region a than it is in region b and it's you know longer yet in region c whereas the arc length that's being swept out is larger in a than it is in b which is larger than it is in C. So these, they almost look like, they kind of look like triangles, you know, if, we, if you will, especially C looks fairly triangular. Um, B and A are, are kind of triangular, but, but kind of not. Um, but so you've got these trade-offs, right? When you're closer to the sun, the, the length of this imaginary line is, is shorter, but you sweep out, but it turns out the planet is traveling faster. And so it, it sweeps out a larger arc length Whereas on the other, on the flip side, when you're farther away from the sun, you sweep, you're moving more slowly. The planet is moving more slowly. It sweeps out a shorter arc length, but this line is much longer. Okay. And it turns out it's not at all obvious just by looking at it. So this is actually a profound statement, Kepler's second law is. Um, but, but those two effects cancel each other out. And so the, the upshot is that the area that's swept out is exactly the same as long as you keep the the amount of time that you've that you swept for equal so if you sweep for a month it doesn't matter where you are in the orbit a month over here is going to give you the same area as a month up here it's going to give you the same as a month down here and so on and that's kepler's second law this is one of the more remarkable of his laws in my mind in, in, in the sense that I, you know i can kind of imagine crunching a lot of data and and figuring out that okay these things travel in elliptical orbits that that i can sort of imagine how he crunched numbers enough and, and just and kind of happened upon the fact that the areas being swept out are equal um, is sort of mind boggling to me. So, you know, Kepler was a smart guy. So maybe it makes more sense to you. I'm impressed that he did it. And I'm, I'm glad because it turns out that, uh, that this was very useful going forward in, in ways that I'll that I'll mention. So that's Kepler's second law. Um, and one important corollary here is that and I kind of mentioned this, but, but I'll say it again. One implication of Kepler's second law is that planets travel faster when they're closer to the sun and more slowly when they're farther away. Okay. But I do want to highlight that is not a statement of Kepler's second law. Kepler's second law is the statement that a planet sweeps out equal areas and equal times. Okay. But given that, you can prove that that, that means that the planet has to be traveling faster when it's nearer the sun and more slowly when it's farther away. And so those are very closely connected um, and, and both worth, worth remembering. So now that brings us to Kepler's third law. 
And this is the only one of Kepler's laws that is typically stated with a with a mathematical expression, um, which you know may or may not make you happy. It, it kind of I suppose depends upon how much you like math. But uh, but it's a statement that the length of time it takes a planet to orbit the sun depends on its distance, and it depends on the distance in a very specific way. And in particular, the um, the period of a planet's orbit, which just means the, the length of time it takes to make one complete orbit, is equal to the semi-major axis of that planet's orbit cubed. Okay, so the square of the of the period is equal to the cube of the semi-major axis. And if you remember, uh, the semi-major axis just means half of the longest uh, diameter, if you will, of the ellipse. And so for, you know, for planets that are orbiting in nearly circular orbits, which again is most, the semi-major axis is essentially equal or very nearly equal to just the average distance uh, between the sun and the planet. And so very often that's an approximation that's made. But since, since we're stating Kepler's laws, you know, very formally here at the outset, um, I want to be clear that strictly speaking, the, the distance uh, or the, the distance that shows up in this law is the semi-major axis. So the semi-major axis to the third power is equal to the period to the second power. And, and, it's, and this is important as well, that if you want to express uh, Kepler's third law in this way, you have to make sure that you measure the period in Earth years. Okay. So, you know, if we want to know about Jupiter, for example, you have to say, well, how long does it take Jupiter to orbit and measure that in Earth years? And the distance um, is measured in astronomical units, so which is again the Earth the Earth Sun distance. So um, so this is pretty powerful because what it means is that if you know how far a planet is away from the Sun, if you know its semi-major axis, then you can just use Kepler's third law and directly calculate um, how long it will take to orbit. Um, or you can work the other way around. If you've taken a bunch of measurements and you can and you figure out, okay, it takes Jupiter um, exactly five years to orbit once. Well, let me figure out how long how or how far away it is. Um, that's not the right number, by the way. It, it, Jupiter's period is is not five years, but that's just sort of an example. Um, and, and this is just a summary of what I just said. That um, there, it turns out that Kepler's law can be written. Uh, Kepler's third law can be written a little more generally than this. There are ways to write it um, that do not require you to use these units. And again, if you took an introductory physics class, um, you you might derive this, or your professor might derive this for you. Um, and you, it would look a little more complicated than this. And so we're going to try to simplify it. Again, this is not a class in, in advanced mathematics, so we're not going to be doing a lot of plugging and chugging uh, when it comes to Kepler's third law. But um, but it's important to know it. This is this is the one of his three laws which has a, math, a, a clear mathematical expression, and this is it. And uh, and again, this this is nice to have. It just says what I said in words earlier. The astronomical unit is just the distance between the Earth and the Sun. 93 million miles, if you like miles, about 150,000 kilometers, um, if you like that. And uh, and so there you have it for all posterity. And that's a unit that, that will be used, that's used very commonly in the solar system. It's used less commonly for astronomers that are dealing outside the solar system, just because things are so much farther away that, uh, that the numbers would, would still be huge. And so uh, we're going to, you know, for in this class, we're going to tend to use light years um, and parsecs, for example, because these are much larger distances than astronomical units. But an astronomical unit is, is still an important unit and, and one that will show up from time to time, uh, especially in the early part of the class. So, so at least for now, uh, commit this to memory um, and, uh, and remember it, the precise number is worth knowing. Um, it's not absolutely critical most of the time, but certainly it's important to know that the astronomical unit is just the, the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Okay, so, you know, I mentioned how impressed I was, at least, that Kepler could derive or, or uh, discover his second law, because again, he's discovering all of these laws just by pouring through book, you know, volume after volume after volume of data taken by Taco Brahe and, and some of his students. Um, but uh, this one, this one in my mind, is a little clearer how you would do this. Um, and 
you're not you not least of which because how you would do this is represented on on this plot or on the slide um, essentially what Kepler would have done is he would have looked at you know he would have analyzed each planet and figured out okay how long it takes each planet to, to go around the Sun so you would have um, you know Mercury's period Venus's period Earth's period which is one because we're measuring in Earth years again and so on so he would get the the periods of all these planets and then somehow he would estimate, you know, calculate the, the distance of these planets from the sun. And then he would look for sun. And then he's, he's trying to figure out, is there a relationship between these things? And so he would start, it, particularly back in his time, um, a way that you would look for correlations like that is by plotting things. Um, and so uh, I'm sure he plotted several things that didn't give him nice, uh, a, a nice line like this uh, before he settled on this. But once he once he found this plot, he would have he would have been much rejoicing um, because it, basically what he's done here is he's plotted the the semi major axis of each object cubed. That's on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis is the period in Earth years squared. Um, and and obviously, you know, when, when you plot those for all of the planets and even these dwarf planets like Pluto and, and Aries and Ceres here as well, everything falls perfectly on a, on, a, on a nice straight line, right? So that says, aha, everything that I can measure is falling on this line, which tells me that it's all obeying the same kind of law. Okay, what is that law? Well, if you remember uh, back in your algebra days, um, you know, the equation of a line, y equals mx plus b, um, it turns out that um, that b is the y-intercept here is zero, which is phenomenal. That mean, means it's even it's even simpler, and so the uh, the equation can just be written as we've already expressed it. The period squared is equal to the semi-major axis cubed. And as we've mentioned, this has a couple of implications. One is that uh, planets that are farther from the sun are traveling more slowly, and they have longer distances to travel. Okay, so they're, they're obviously going to take longer. So as we saw on the end of the last slide, applying Kepler's third law to the Earth um, is, is somewhat trivial um, by, by construction in some sense. Um, but if we look at the Earth and we say, well, what happens if we plug into this equation? We say, well, the period of the Earth's orbit is one, right? One year. So the left side of this equation uh, gives you one squared, you know, one times one, which is one. And the right side of the equation says, well, what's the, what's the distance of the Earth between the Earth and the Sun? What's its semi-major axis? And the answer is, well, an astronomical unit by definition. And so the right side is one to the third power, which is one. So, you know, as we ended up the last slide, um, the, you know, if you sort of check Kepler's third law with, with regard to the Earth, you get one equals one, um, which is good, you know, in the sense that it's true. And so that, that gives you, you know, that means that Kepler's law is, is giving you a valid answer, uh, but it's not very uh, insightful in the sense that, yeah, we, we know that. Okay. Um, but we can apply it to Jupiter, for example, um, where, where the numbers are quite different. Um, and it turns out that it works just as well, right? And we kind of, we see that graphically in the, uh, you know, in this plot here at, uh, at left, Jupiter falls on the line just the same as Earth does, um, but you can also crunch the numbers. Uh, and so you can find out that, you know, Jupiter, the, the semi-major axis is about five times uh, Earth's, so it's about five astronomical units from the sun. Um, and it turns out that means that the, uh, that the orbital period is about 11.86 years. And so you could, you know, again, once you know Kepler's third law is true, that means that all, as long as you know one of these things, either the orbital period or the orbital distance, the semi-major axis, then you can immediately calculate the other. So let's take a look at an example um, and, and consider what we can, now that we're experts in Kepler's three laws of planetary motion, see what we, can, uh, what we can infer from the following statement. So imagine a scenario where you're reading the newspaper uh, and you're informed that a new planet has been discovered around uh, another star. So it's not, not a magical scenario where there's a secret planet or, you know, in our own solar system. This is an extrasolar planet or orbiting some other star in the cosmos. And the newsma newspaper makes the following statement, that the average speed of the planet is 33 kilometers per second, 
So that's saying as it orbits the star, it travels on average 33 kilometers per second. And when the planet is closest to the star, it's moving at 31 kilometers per second. And when it's farthest from the star, it's moving at 35 kilometers per second. So that's, that's the statement that you read. The question then is, there's something wrong with it. I'm just up front, I'm going to tell you there's something wrong with that statement. And the question is, well, um, what's wrong with it? Okay, so there are four possibilities here. So I'll pause here for, for 30 or 45 seconds or so and let you, let you read this. And of course, if you want more time, feel free to pause me. You're always welcome to do that. Um, and then I'll come back and discuss it. Okay, let's go ahead and, and take stock of, of the situation here. So, answer A, uh, the claim is the average speed is much too fast. Well, we haven't said anything about uh, average speeds, uh, average orbital speeds, and certainly they're gonna be different. They're, they're higher for planets that are closer to the sun and, and lower for planets farther away from the sun. Uh, but it turns out this is not out of, out of the realm of, of reasonableness. Um, so, uh, so that's, it's not answer A. Um, answer B, uh, Kepler's third law states that planets must sweep out equal areas at equal times, so the speed of the planet cannot change. Okay, so this is an interesting answer because, you know, there were, uh, when I was in graduate school for several years, I taught uh, test prep courses for the Princeton Review, and this is a classic example of an answer that um, is tempting because it starts, it, it's a two-part answer where the first part is, is correct. It gives you a true statement and then follows it up with an incorrect sort of inference. Okay. Because the, well, and there are a couple of, a couple of problems here, actually. Firstly, Kepler's third law doesn't say anything about equal areas and equal times. Okay. That's, that's actually Kepler's second law. So even the first part is wrong here. Um, but it, it may be tempting because it says, well, equal areas and equal times. I remember that. Um, but, you know, even, even if it had correctly said, um, Kepler's second law, um, the, uh, the second part is definitely wrong. Uh, th this conclusion that the speed of the planet cannot change, that's just wrong, right? Um, it is, it is the case that planets travel faster, um, when they're, uh, closer to the sun and slower when they're farther away. They, they, uh, they do change speeds as they move. So, so answer B is incorrect. Answer C then, uh, Kepler's second law states that the planet must move faster when it is closest, not farthest from the star. And that's correct, right? So, you know, I spent a, a little bit of time emphasizing that Kepler's second law, the, the explicit technical statement of it is in equal areas and equal times law, right? So that as a planet orbits, this imaginary line between the star and the planet sweeps out equal areas and equal times. Um, but one immediate implication of that statement is that, in fact, for that to be true, planets must travel faster in their orbit when they're near the star and slower when they're farther away from the star. So, so C is going to be the right answer. Um, just to, to kill answer D as well, the claim is using these numbers, the square of the orbital period is not equal to the cube of the semi-major axis. Well, we have no idea because we, we weren't given those numbers at all, right? So that's just, just a misnomer. So, so answer C is the answer. So you've probably heard of Galileo, um, but and in fact, I've even mentioned him in passing before, but uh, he, he is deserving of at least one slide unto himself. And so let's actually pause for a second and talk about him. Um, Galileo was a contemporary of Kepler. So there was a lot of stuff going on in the world of astronomy, at the, well, and science generally um, in this time. Uh, and, you know, he's credited with designing the first telescope. That's a little bit... Uh, it, 
that's a little bit of a stretch to say that because he, he certainly did do a lot of, tel of, of telescopic design. Um, but the very first uh, thing that he did is he took an existing design, which was used by, uh, by sea captains, um, and he just and he had the the eureka moment, if you will, to realize that well, if this thing is good for for magnifying things, you know, on the sea, if I want to look at a, at a ship far away and see, you know, I can make it bigger. Uh, well, then it might be good at uh, at magnifying things in the sky as well. So he didn't actually design the first uh, optical instrument that that became a telescope. What he did is he had the good sense to point it up at the sky. And then once he made that, it had that sort of insight, then he went on and he did develop it and build his own telescopes and so on. Um, but uh, but it's, it's sort of phenomenal what he was able to do just at the very outset, just you know, with, with the earliest telescopes that were certainly compared to what we have now, very rudimentary, but obviously it was, it was earth shattering from an astronomical perspective, just because um, it immediately magnified things so much uh, beyond what, what you could see with the naked eye. And so almost immediately, he was able to observe sunspots, um, which, uh, which we'll talk about in more detail when we talk about the sun, but there are dark patches, uh, relatively small dark patches on the sun. Um, and that's kind of an interesting thing because obviously if you just take a telescope and point it directly at the sun, um, what you do is you just you don't see sunspots you just blind yourself and so he had the good sense to uh to, to be be more clever than that um but he saw sunspots um he saw craters on the moon um which we now take for granted and in fact if you just look up in the night sky you can see craters um but if you haven't looked at them with a telescope or in high resolution you know um then you by no means know what they were uh right so but he was able to see clearly that okay there are craters on the moon um, he was able to observe the phases of Venus, which is something that you probably, you know, in all likelihood have never heard of. It turns out that Venus has phases just as the moon does. They're much harder to see, and, and you certainly cannot see them with the naked eye. But Galileo was able to see them with his telescope. And, and also something else that was very important is he was able to see a vastly increased uh, number of stars in the Milky Way. Um, you know, because obviously when you walk out at night and you just look up at the sky, you see isolated points uh, of light, you see these stars, but there's a whole lot more there, uh, it turns out, that you don't see with your naked eye and that Galileo was able, able to see. And so all of a sudden, you go from a situation where you just imagine that there's stuff out there and you can see it, to a realization that, wow, there's a lot more out there than what I could ever see before. And... And a second implication is then, well, what else, what else is out there that I'm not able to see even with this telescope, right? And so as soon as you, as soon as you, your this veil is pulled back, if you will, and you realize there's a lot more out there than I ever thought possible, um, you immediately start to see the importance of the value of building bigger and bigger and better telescopes um, because you just you don't know what's out there, right? It's the unknown unknowns. Um, but at least now, Galileo, for the first time, was able to, to sort of convert an unknown unknown into a known unknown. So it's now people know there's stuff out there that they don't know about, and, they, and that inspires you know, more and more people to go look. So this is, um, you know, I, I can't make a whole lot out of this, but for posterity, um, you know, here are some, some actual notes from Galileo, his observations of the moons of Jupiter. And this is one thing that he's particularly well known for. Um, the four largest moons of Jupiter, which are, are shown here. This is Jupiter. Um, this is an actual telescopic image. You've got Jupiter and you've got the four uh, largest moons, which are not very creatively now today known as the Galilean moons, because they are the ones that he saw. Since then, we've discovered there are a whole heck of a lot more moons. Uh, I, I confess off the top of my head, I don't remember the precise number, 73 maybe or something like that. Some absurd number of moons around Jupiter. Most of them are quite small, um, but, the, but these four are, are visible, were visible to Galileo. And if you take Astronomy 30, for example, or if you just get yourself a backyard telescope, you know, that's, you know, a, a six, you know, even a four inch um, telescope, um, you, this is something that you can see, actually. So, uh, so that's pretty cool. And he was the first one to see it.
One other thing that he was able to determine, which is also pretty cool, um, is that these moons, that um, they follow Kepler's third law, right? So he was able to see the moons, and so he had the good sense to, to follow them night after night and figure out, well, how long do these moons take to orbit? And he was able to measure their the distances, uh, you know, the semi-major axis of these of these moons as well. And he checked them again kept against Kepler's third law and found that, well, not only do, do uh, the planets in the solar system follow Kepler's third law, but, but these moons do too. And that, I don't know whether it seems like it, but that's actually a very sort of in, very important uh, observation because what it means is there's something fundamentally connected between what's causing the planets to orbit the sun and what's causing the moons to orbit Jupiter, okay? And today we can say, well, of course, it's gravity. It's the gravitational force. It's one of the four fundamental forces of nature and gravity um, as such, it works um, the same anywhere in the universe, okay? But this was very much a, uh, not taken for granted at all at that time. Um, and so it kind of speaks to the importance uh, and the value of, of Galileo's observations here in that they, they the fact that they're taken for granted now means that they were so foundational in the development of, of our modern understanding of physics and astronomy. And as I said, Galileo is able now to, now that he has a telescope and he can magnify things and look farther, you know, effectively look farther in the universe, he's able to see that there are just countless more stars in the Milky Way than, you know, than we ever thought, thought possible before. So it really starts uh, making us wonder, well, how big is the Milky Way? How big is the universe and, you know, and what is out there? So I mentioned as well, one of his uh, other very important observations was the phases of, of Venus. Um, and one particular reason that this is important is that uh, the, while Venus would have phases, regardless of whether we live in a geocentric or a heliocentric solar system. Remember, Galileo is making these measurements and these observations when, when the verdict is still out on whether the Earth is at the center of the solar system or the Sun is at the center of the solar system. This is very much still an area of, of argumentation and, uh, and research. Um, but, the, uh, but this particular observation, the phases of Venus, is crucial because it turns out that the phases of Venus will be different depending upon whether a geocentric model is correct or a heliocentric model is correct. And so, you know, if you think back to our first lecture or just in general about how the scientific method works, right? The idea is you, you collect data, you make observations, you build a model, and then you test that model. And if it agrees, great, you, you do another test. If it disagrees, then you go back to the drawing board and ask, okay, well, how do I have to modify my theory um, or my model in order to explain this new data? And so in this particular case, Galileo is faced with two competing models of the solar system, a heliocentric and a geocentric model. And he's thinking to himself then, well, what data can I take? What measurement can I make um, that would be able to distinguish between these two models? Um, what's an effective test? And, and the phases of Venus are it. And so he made very careful observations of the phases of Venus. Um, and it turns out, as, as you probably you know, could anticipate at this point, the heliocentric model won out. Um, and, you know, this was very controversial at the time because certainly this upended the majority of, of, uh, of astronomers at the time and not just astronomers, but the vast majority of the world. You know, people that thought about it at all um, took for granted, uh, they certainly had historically for thousands of years, that the Earth was at the center of the solar system. And so now Galileo is not only saying, no, I don't think so, He's saying, I don't think so, and I took measurements, so now I know so, okay? So this is the first bit of data that unequivocally says, no, the sun is at the center of the solar system, and like it or not, the Earth is orbiting. And here are some sketches of, you know, that Galileo provided of, the, uh, of his observations of the phases of Venus, which, again, it's, uh, you can see these with, with a backyard telescope again. It's, certainly, they're not as easy to see as the moon phases, but, but they are visible. And if you have a really nice telescope, you can take uh, images like that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I can't take images like that myself, but uh, 
But if you get a big enough telescope, you can. Okay. And and again, this is just, we're not going to spend a lot of time doing the details of, uh, you know, what what are the phases of, of Venus's orbit and how would they be different between, you know, a geocentric model and, and a heliocentric model. Um, if you're, you know, if you were taking Astro 10 and, and focusing on the solar system, it's very likely you'd spend more time on that. For us, it's going to be sufficient just to know that, that the phases, uh, the order of the phases will be different depending upon whether a heliocentric or a geocentric model is correct. And it turns out that that reality uh, fits with a heliocentric model. Okay, so uh, we've talked a lot now, and, and I promise we're nearing the end, but we've talked a lot about Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. Um, but it's important, and you know, I, and I can't emphasize enough how much work he had to have put into developing those laws. But it's important to note that these are some; these are a kind of law that we call empirical laws. So, in other words, they describe how nature works, but they don't tell you why, and they don't even attempt to. They, they're just an observation, right? An empirical law is is a law based on observations. So he looked around, he took a lot of data and he said, look, I found some laws that, that describe the data. They don't explain it, they describe it. So they're perfectly good at, uh, at calculating things. You know, if you know how long it takes Uranus to, to orbit, I can use Kepler's third law to calculate its semi-major axis. Um, but it doesn't tell you anything about why that would be true. Okay. So, and, and I want to emphasize that because we're very soon going to take the next step and, and try to figure out um, or, or see how historically it was figured out why these things would be true. But just to summarize Kepler's three laws again, um, first law says that planets orbit the sun in ellipses with the sun at a focus. Second law is that equal areas are swept out in equal times, or as I've written here, planets travel faster in when they're nearer the sun and slower when they're farther away from the sun. And then the third law is that there's this very fundamental connection between how long it takes a planet to orbit and how far away it is, uh, how far from the sun. And, and in particular, the mathematical statement is that the square of the orbital period is equal to the cube of the semi-major axis. And so these were great success. You know, everyone agreed. There was no question that these were, were correct laws, but it took a hundred years before anyone was able to explain why. Uh, where do these laws come from? You know, why on earth would they be true? And it turns out that, that the man responsible for explaining this is somebody that you will have heard of, and, and that's Isaac Newton. So Isaac Newton, um, we can, and, and I have written on this slide, he was a British mathematician and physicist, but he was a whole, I mean, he was um, a Renaissance man, if ever there was one, really. Um, so he started off studying mathematics, and then he did, you know, just about anything that was worth doing um, during his life. Uh, he developed calculus um, out of necessity in order to, to explain his, and describe his gravitational theory. So, you know, it may be that you're not a lover of calculus. If not, then I'm sorry. Um, it's a lot of fun. But basically, you know, as he was trying to develop a theory of gravity and, and explain, you know, why would Kepler's laws be true, he, he found that the math, you know, to do that description didn't exist. And so he just, he developed it on the fly. And if that sounds crazy, it turns out that actually most of, well, Maybe, maybe most is a stretch, I'm not sure, but I, I'm, I'm certainly tempted to say that most of math is developed in that way. Um, there are pure mathematicians out there that have no interest in applications, but it rarely started that way. Um, almost every field of math um, started off with an application and was developed by somebody that was trying to describe something. And so throughout history, there's been a very close connection between the development of physics um, and, and, and astronomy and the development of mathematics. And, and Isaac Newton is a perfect example of, of somebody that was right at, at that nexus and, and sort of developed new math out of, out of necessity.
And so he developed calculus. Um, full disclosure, there was a, a German mathematician by the name of Leibniz um, that developed calculus essentially simultaneously. And so even during their lifetimes, there was there was very much an argument about who really should should get credit. Um, and I think it's fair to say that Newton gets more credit, um, but uh, but Leibniz, Leibniz gets some credit too, and he certainly did a did a whole lot of work as well. Um, but so Newton developed calculus. He also developed three laws of motion, um, not planetary motion specifically, but these were more general um, laws. So Newton's laws of motion um, that we'll I'll briefly mention here in the next couple of slides. And then finally, um, he developed a law of gravity, um, Newton's law of gravitation, which was phenomenally successful at describing the gravitational interactions of, of bodies in the solar system and beyond. And we will certainly talk about that. So first, let's let's briefly state Newton's laws of motion. If you took an introductory physics class um, it, in mechanics, um, Newton's laws would form the basis of of that class. Okay. So if you take a physics class, this is the very first thing that you'll that you'll study, um, or it's the foundation, you know, of, of a semester of of introductory physics. And the first law of motion is can be stated in a few different ways, but you know, a very common statement is that an object at rest stays at rest, and an object in motion stays at motion, stays in motion at constant velocity. I, I didn't write that, but at constant velocity until acted on by an outside force. And so um, it's a it's a fairly simple statement, um, but it turns out that in Newton's time it was it was very revolutionary. Um, because it kind of it, it's against common experience in the sense that if you you know if you push a you know a box across a table it slows down and it stops and you didn't see a force acting on it right so you just think oh okay it just it, it slowed down that's the normal thing that it does but Newton is saying no no if there weren't a force acting on it it would continue at constant velocity um, so if it's slowing down something must be acting on it um, the first law of motion is also sometimes referred to as the law of inertia because inertia is the tendency for an object to maintain its current state um, of motion, either being at rest or moving at constant velocity. And so, um, so Newton's first law is sometimes known as the law of inertia. And you know, one, one great uh, tool for illustrating this is an air hockey table where um, you know, essentially the airflow greatly reduces the frictional forces between the, the hockey pucks and the and the, the table. And so if you, if you have played air hockey, you hit a puck, you know, across the table and it does slow down a little bit, but not nearly as much as, as it would if there were actually direct contact. Right. And so in fact, so it tends to continue at essentially constant velocity until it hits the edge of the table and then, you know, gets reflected um, and then continues again at constant velocity until it gets reflected again. So uh, if you need an excuse to play air hockey, just, you know, go go demonstrate Newton's first law of motion. So Newton's second law of motion is the is the only one that is typically expressed in a mathematical form. And and for what it's worth, it's also the one that is used in calculations. So, you know, I told you that Newton's laws form the foundation of an intro class in physics. Um, Newton's second law is the one that you'll be applying over and over and over again. Um, and in the statement is just that if a force acts on an object, it will cause the object to accelerate by an amount proportional to the force. And in particular, the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Okay. And this is for an unbalanced force, right? If you apply a force and somebody else applies an equal and opposite force, then it's, you know, you're not going to accelerate. But if you, if you have an object all by itself and you just apply a single unbalanced force, for example, as in this diagram, you know, by pushing uh, on on an object, then you're going to cause it to accelerate. OK. Um, and in particular, then, if you add up all of the forces at, acting on an object and you measure that object's mass, then you can use Newton's second law to calculate how it accelerates. Um, in other words, you can determine, is it speeding up? Is it slowing down? Is it changing direction? And, and you can quantitatively answer that. So Newton's first law of motion essentially just says, unless you have an unbalanced force, unless you have a net force, the object will just continue in the state of motion that it already is. Um, Newton's second law is telling you, if you have an unbalanced or a net force, how will that object's velocity change? And that's what acceleration is.
So again, if you were taking a physics class, we would spend a whole lot of time actually calculating uh, with Newton's second law. This is a, uh, an astronomy class, so we're not going to do that, um, but it's important to know what Newton's second law is. And then finally, Newton's third law of motion says that forces come in pairs, and whenever you push on something, it's pushing back or exert a force on something. It doesn't have to be a push, literally. Um, but if you exert a force on something, then it's going to exert a force back on you, um, which is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And so very often you'll hear Newton's third law stated as um, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Um, and that's Newton's third law. So, you know, to give you an example, if I, you know, if I push on a wall with some force, that wall pushes back on me with exactly the same force. Um, if I stand on the floor, um, then, you know, and my feet exert a force on the floor, then the floor exerts a force back on my feet. Um, or as in, in this uh, diagram here, if, you know, if a woman is pulling on a rope, with some force, the rope pulls back on the woman with that force again. So again, if this were an introductory class in physics, we would spend a lot of time actually applying, you know, this law in, in a number of situations and, and doing calculations. For better or for worse, we're not going to do that here. Um, but again, this is Newton's third law. And so, and that brings us to the end. So the, the last thing that I want to leave you with, because again, um, Kepler's three laws of motion are, are things that we will sort of focus on for, for a week or two. And, and those are things that, that we really do want to drive home. Um, Newton's law of gravity, which we haven't introduced in detail not yet. We've just kind of said it's there. So hopefully that you'll come back for more because there's plenty more where that came from. Um, Newton's laws of, of motion, first, second, and third, are things that I, I may refer to in passing here and there throughout the rest of the semester, but we're not going to do, you know, these detailed calculations with them, for example, that you would do in a physics class. But what I do want to focus on is just the, the progress and the development of science that we've kind of gone through very quickly here, um, but where we're, we're just constantly refining the model of, of the solar system and of the universe more generally as we get more and more data. OK, and, and importantly, and kind of what's what's up here at the top here is is this very important point in science that theories are falsifiable. OK, mm -hmm. um, a scientific theory is falsifiable. And what that means is that for a theory to be scientific, it needs to be able to make a prediction which is testable. Right. If you just if you posit something, if you just say I have a theory that you know, blank, but it gives no testable hypothesis then that's not a scientific theory, okay? Maybe in some other field, you can call it a theory because and there are plenty of fields in which you don't have to be right to be very successful. Um, but science is not one of those fields. Science is actually concerned with the description of nature as it is. Um, and so if, you know, if a theory isn't falsifiable in principle, then it's not a scientific theory. And so, um, so all of the theories that we've talked about here were falsifiable and many of them were falsified right? They had some, some measure of success. They correctly described some number of things. Um, but then something was, some measurement was taken, some observation was made um, that contradicted the theory. And so you're constantly going back to the drawing board. Um, you know, as an example here, Copernicus proposes that planets move in circular orbits um, with epicycles, right? Um, and then Tycho Brahe takes a lot of data um, and then Kepler uses that data to, to develop his three laws of planetary motion and make these predictions um, about where planets should be when. Um, and and when, he, when he does that, we find out that, well, Copernicus's idea is falsified, okay? These epicycles, these you know, circular orbits with epicycles, that, that's not true. So what's the next idea? Well, the next idea is, well, maybe these aren't circular orbits after all. Maybe they're ellipses. Um, and, and then more data was taken and, and it agreed with that. Okay. So Kepler's laws won the day and, and there was much rejoicing, but now, at least by those that, that were interested in describing nature as it is. Um, but then the question became, well, why, why are Kepler's laws true? Why should planets orbit in ellipses with the sun at a focus? Um, and, and that's kind of where Newton came along and made the next, you know, really phenomenally large stride in terms of scientific knowledge and understanding um, as he developed his, 
his laws of motion and in particular his law of, of gravity, which we will talk about shortly. So thanks for your attention. Um, that's, that's all for today. And I will see you next time for lecture six.